Okay, here I am in Nashville. I came down to Greg Pennington's farm, and this is his beautiful shop to make a Windsor chair. All right, Greg, where are we? Uh, we're in my shop here in Hendersonville, Tennessee. Who made this shop? Uh, I did, and a bunch of friends of mine. Completely, every piece. Completely, yep. Trees I cut mostly up in Indiana. We build them on my Woodmiser sawmill, and mostly red oak, white oak, and just a whole bunch of domestic hardwood. And how long have you been making chairs? Uh, probably since 2003. I've been on a, just an amazing journey and just learning from some of the best people around. When, when did you begin to do the class? Uh, 2009 is when I raised this barn and started probably 2010 full time. With the full intentions of teaching? Yeah. yeah. Right on. Yeah. Here you can see how beautiful Greg's shop is and how well equipped it is. If you take this class, you won't need to bring anything. He has everything you need in multiples. And this is the Windsor Continuous Arm rocking chair that we're going to be making. And it's uh, got a lot of history. You can Google it. To save time, Greg made all the maple turned legs and it turned in a traditional style. And if he had this, the students do it, it would just take too long. So he prepares some of the more complicated parts before we get there. And here you can see him making the part that's going to hold up the armrest on the top side of the chair. And he uses a story stick, which gives him all the main components. And he knows how thick the stick should be at each one of those parts. And he uses that tool right there. And with the, the thin chisel, he's able to turn that little section down to the thickness he needs. And those give him the milestones he needs to get to. And there you see the blank out of hard maple and the finished part. And now we're going to throw up what are going to become all the spindles for the back of the chair from white oak. And Greg, I'm going to let Greg take over and do some of the instruction here. Those are going to become our bent backs, and you'll see that in just a minute. So maybe we can get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We need. We're going to, so it's just going to pop right apart. So it's. You can see how look, that's that's right down that growth ring. I don't want to hit it too hard, but you can see it's probably, it might run out that way. So we have a brake box here. And you always pull the handle to the thicker side because the fulcrum down low, it puts the more pressure on the, this part. And I can hold back on the thinner part. And you're just trying to equalize the pressure so the split will run straight. Now when you're, some people use the sapwood. The reason I don't, I've had issues with it in the past. I definitely wouldn't mix them in a chair. It's robbing in a nutshell, so that's how we get perfectly. Like you said before, the whole has to improve. They right. put it a couple yeah. hundred show, years. Show me a scene. Like, that's cool. Yeah. A lot more. So yeah. This is two inch thick clear pine. It's 19 by 19 inches. And these are gonna become the seats of the chair. Grain up, grain down. Uh, you can do it either way. You get a different grain pattern. If you carve the heart side up, you get figure eight grain pattern. If you do the heart side down, you get sort of a oh, It's a little easier to carve, I think, in this manner. Yeah. But we're gonna use this as the top simply because this one got a little close to the pith. Greg froed and split up these 60 inch long pieces that are going to become our bent backs. Now we got to take some time and prep them and get them ready. But I just go and bandsaw out some of it so you're not having to draw knife off such a wide piece. You just bandsaw that out and keep this one solid piece. And yes. This is just, you might get 250 years out of it now. So um, we'll grab these and go upstairs and uh, I'll see what we do next. Oh, cool. I'll get some uh, draw knife action to play. So basically, all I'm doing is just smoothing this up. Okay? I'm not doing anything as far as changing the shape of that. I'm just kind of getting all the little imperfections off. Mm -hmm. Now, these bent backs are made out of white oak again. And I learned something from Greg. He said each one of the different pieces of material, for instance, the white oak, is used for its 
qualities, the bendable and the strength. And the seat made out of pine is used for its uh, ease and ability to, to be able to be carved. And the legs are made out of hard maple for its strength. And here you see us working these parts with the shave horse and the draw knives. And Greg has all the tools available and they're all well kept and they're all beautifully sharp. And we did most of the work uh, on flattening that one side and now he removes a lot of the material on the bandsaw. He's just doing a little demo so I can film him. And then we take it back inside and we start doing some more of the details and working up the thickness. This all has to be about three quarters, no, seven eighths thick. And then everything has certain milestones. And if you're working in the class, in this case, I'm working with with Rob Rojas, who, who works with me here in New York in the shop, and Patrick Reynolds, who's my electrician. We all went down there together to hang out with Anne of all trades. You'll see Anne in the, in the video as well. And uh, here you see me working that part. And uh, you really got to be conscientious of the grain direction. It's funny because each one of us as a group, we were all brought to certain milestones. Bring this up to this thickness and then wait and then bring it up to that thickness and then wait. And you keep thinking you're messing up. You're thinking you're going too far. But Greg has taught this class enough to know he has a lot of confidence, even in some pretty, pretty, pretty horrible mistakes. As we're carving, we're thinking we're going too deep or we're having some tear out and we think it's, it's insurmountable. But by the time each one of us put our chairs together, me, Rob, and Patrick were all working on the same design. Anne was just working on things. She's got a lot of projects started, and she tried to spend this week to finish them. There you can see that thinner part is what's going to become bent up and be under your elbows and your hands. And now's the time we put them in the steam box. Now these are still not quite perfectly where they need to be. There's still a lot more carving to be taking place on each one of these. So you put it in the steam box for about 45 minutes at about 250 degrees and the steam box goes through the wall of course it's about six feet long and i thought that was a cool idea it's funny to go to somebody else's shop and learn all the cool tips and tricks that you'll go home and steal from them and in this case this is a permanent steam box obviously greg makes bent back chairs for a living so he needs a permanent steam box and now we take it out and we prep it it's really important to get that center line right on the crest of the bend and you can see you bend it and you put those pegs and clamp it in place. You have about a minute to get that bend in place before it starts stiffening up again and not being able to be pliable. Here you see each one of our chairs in place. This is day one and so that these can sit in the jigs for the next four days. And now it's to the spindles. We're all jamming on the spindles, learning the milestones that we need to get to on the spindles. And in this case, one end has to be 7 16 the other end has to be half inch, and in the middle, six inches up, we got to be about three quarters or seven eighths. See how much material needs to come off of there. Um, at the top, they kind of fall off faster and kind of end up 7 16 straight towards the top. Mm -hmm. um, if you leave too much material on, they might check in the kiln and crack. Um, and obviously, if you take off too much, you end up with gaps and yep, yep. other visual. All of these spindles are being carved from green wood, wet wood, non-kiln dried wood. So is the bent back that is also wet wood. And they carve very easily when they're wet, much easier than when they're dry. And that's why Greg mentioned the kiln. We get them down to size. We do a rough roughing size. We go square and then we go uh, octagon and start to work them into rounds. And then we put them in the kiln for Maybe, did we leave him in the kiln for maybe two days? Patrick is learning the shave horse and draw a knife, and Rob has a little bit of experience, and I have a little bit of experience. And now we're going from square to octagon, or rather to, uh, yeah, octagon, that's eight sides, and slowly start working it. And here, I think I messed up a few, some of them are bent from weird grain direction, but by the time it's done, you'd be surprised at how beautifully symmetrical they all seem. And they're all just handmade. And uh, just working them a little bit at a time. So you kind of know what's going on. So I would set this off to the side. I would put a mirror here. And I would get my drill 
and line it up parallel to that in the mirror. This going right down, this leaning towards the sight line. Wow. And that's how I would drill that way. To see, you just connect the dots. Mm -hmm. See, I can see them off a little bit. But it, that line, that laser line is so large, you can't, it's, it's hard to see. So there you go. See, I'm right at 19. Yeah, that's good. The beauty of this is I don't have to, I don't have to set that for either side again. So now I'm going to put that right over cross hatch of where I'm drilling there. And now I've got my 19 degrees this way and level to the bench that way. And I can feel it change. Uh, I've got to come out the bottom of the hole and you just kind of yep. melt down through that. And yeah, I got some tear out. It's just the nature of the beast with this pond. But um, it's on the bottom, so she's got to turn her legs too. She doesn't have anything to rain too. Now each one of us drills our leg holes from the top through to the bottom and Greg described the sight line and the angle line from each one of the 90 degree intersecting laser lines. This way we know the angle that we're going through and the leg is going to be at. The sight line is at 90 degrees and of course the rake is at what it needs to be for the two front legs and then the two back legs. And now we begin to use this auger or this tapering jig and it has a tapered razor blade that follows the profile of that tapering jig. And as we notch out the holes, the leg goes in deeper and deeper. And we're using the dividing calipers to make sure we go down six and one quarter inches from the sight line that's at the crest of that bulbous spot on the spindle. And we want to make sure that all four of them go in the same depth. And then once they do, we mark them and we set our grain pattern in the right direction. Here you see Rob doing the same thing. You got to burrow out. There's Patrick doing the same thing. You got to burrow out a little bit, then clean out your, your scraper. You're basically scraping the inside of that hole. Just as a reminder, we drill down through the top, flip it over, and now we're burrowing out the tapers for each one of the legs from the bottom. And once we get everything positioned, like I said earlier, we make sure the grain direction is correct and we position those legs in each one of those spots permanently. And we mark them so we always know we can go back. And now we're tapering the armrests. So this is the spindle that's going to be the armrest, so we're doing that from the top down. And now I'm drilling all the holes that are going to be for the spindles across the back under the bow. And I'm using the technique with the mirror. You start in the center and you work your way out and the angles change a little bit. The sight line, which is the always 90 to the table, is obviously the one that I'm moving from the center. And then I'm using the, the sliding bevel and the mirror to match my angles as they get increasingly more and more leaned as we go out from the center to the left and the right. And now I'm just checking the depth. Everything has to be at least one inch. You can see all the sight line markings that are on the pattern that you sketch down onto your, your seat. You have all these, these indications on what and how to do. And now this is the gutter. This is a little quarter inch wide carved line. And we never exceed that line. We never go past that line. And now this is the fun spot. We drill two holes. To give us a depth, you can kind of see them underneath my my uh, scoop there. And this is, I think this is called the, the, he called it the potato, which is again just another scooping scraper carver. Lots of different scoopy scraper carvers, some handmade by some of Greg's friends in the chair making game. Some really, really beautiful old traditional tools when it comes to this method. And there's a more refined as you get more and more refined the tools get a little bit sexier and a little bit sharper the whole time going down the grain you got to go down the grain you got to i always say go down the steps that's what i always say and there's also milestones when it comes to this and greg has us each hitting each one of the milestones always go down the steps the grain direction is constantly changing you got to be conscientious that you don't get too much tear out if you get tear out, you got to come from the opposite direction. You got to make sure that you don't get so much tear out that you can't fix it. But it seems everything's fixable. Again, following some of the the destination lines that Greg has indicated that we need to get to. 
Now it's time to cut the back off. We left the back square because we clamped it a lot while we were working on the front edge, in and out of the vise, also the the clamp downs, the hold downs on the on the carving table. And now that we're out of there, we can go back into the carving table and start working that. Skew and slice makes everything nice is a little rhyme that Greg and Trevor told us to do. And when you're using that draw knife, you slide it, shave it, and in some cases you see a good straight pull, a lot of times you see a skewed pull. And here using a spoke shave as well. So as each one of the cuts gets more refined, so then do the tools. And this was a little bit of a complicated curve. This is sort of the finishing part of putting the contours on the seat. And I'm just refining that little line that goes up your butt between your legs. Always leaving the line, I know I'm safe. Push the tip in so it doesn't slip out on you. Uh -huh. Rotate the leg where it's directly facing here. You can feel that, you, can yep. know, you know when you're centered. Right. And then when you, ha you have it, never put your hand here obviously, but you know, either here or here, you're gonna go full speed and then just melt it in the hole. And I believe on this one, we bury that white line right there. So many tips and tricks that I learned hanging around with Greg, of course, when you do this type of build over and over, you learn new things, some ancient techniques, some new, some done from when they first made this chair, some brand new. This is a really simple, interesting technique. How do you get that compound angle inside that leg? Just come at it with a really long drill bit from the opposite side, turn it a little bit, and you land right where you need to then turn it back when you put your spindles together. Here you see me putting the that stretcher bar between the two rear legs. This design only needs the stretcher bar in the back. There won't be any other stretcher bars on this chair between any of the other legs. Lots of dry fitting. That's why I said it was important to mark where your legs go in the grain direction. Always taking it apart and putting it back together. And here we're marking the slots that are going to take the wedges. So the, the spindles go all the way through the chair and then they get wedges through the slots that I'm putting in there. And you'll notice that device that Greg made so you can hold an unusual shape inside of the vise. There you can see it again. And just using the pull saw to slot that. Just using hide glue. Hide glue, you keep it warm, brush it in. And uh, hide glue is, is interesting. I, I've always known about it. I don't use it that much. But hide glue, you can heat it up, steam it, and then you could dismantle and put it back together again. So that's why a lot of guitar and luthiers use it, violins and such, because you can restore it later. If you had to, you could take it apart and fix it. And now I'm up and through the chair, and I'm coming down with my, my wedges from the top down. And the wedges are made out of the white oak banging them into place with a little bit of glue on one side of the wedge. Greg explained the reason for that, but I forget what it was. <laughs> so much tradition goes into these. You cut them close. You don't want to dig into the seat, which is extremely easy to do. And then with a chisel, just a paring chisel, clean off that open end grain, get it nice and level with everything. And since it's hard maple, it is very hard. You gotta use nice, sharp tools, but it carves beautifully. It's all compressed, jammed into that hole, and it cuts really nice. And a lot of people will leave this seat with carved surfaces. I personally wanted to smooth it out, so I'm using a piece of 10 ounce leather I brought with me that's inside that as a sanding block. If you have 10 ounce leather or heavier, makes a really nice sanding block. The paper's just wrapped around that. And then you know if you have a nice sanding block, it gives you a nice smooth contour. And there we are. We're up to the seat with the legs on it, which was a huge accomplishment. This might be day three. And now what we're doing is we are routing the slots through the front and back legs on the left and the right side. These slots are going to carry the rocking arms, the curved rockers for the bottom that are the the rockers for the rocking chair. And Greg's using a giant Festool router, probably like a five horsepower or something like that, maybe a three horsepower, with a half inch cutting head. And he takes two passes to get down to full depth. 
and that jig helps you create it so that those slots are right in line with the front and back legs on the left and right side of the chair. And there you can see that. And those open ends get beveled up. Some of the guys used the spoke shaved. I use this Japanese rasp, which is good for me. No tear out. And when you're cutting up and across end grain, it makes a really nice sound and you know that you're getting some good stuff accomplished. And once again, for strength and flexibility, the rockers are made out of white oak. Greg cuts them out of a thick piece and then splits them in half so that they match, the grain matches exactly on the left and the right side. He makes them for us, again, because we're kind of pressed for time while we're in a class. And they're just uh, thrown through the planer and then, then pattern routed, so they're all exactly the same. And uh, so they're basically book matched, the left and right. They have the same exact grain pattern because they once were the same piece of wood in that same configuration. And it's really amazing when you get to this part, the sense of accomplishment you feel. There you can see, and uh, now it's up to us. We can bevel it, we can stylize, put a bevel. I left them kind of square or as square as possible. I did break the edge a little bit, but I try to leave everything nice and as square as possible. There's another technique later. We'll get the bevel off the bottom to some extent. And now it is about four days later. Our continuous bent back is out of the jig. It's dried enough to basically stay where it needs to stay. We're marking our holes that are going to take the spindles that come up through the seat, our arm spindles. We have to make sure we're the exact distance apart that we need to to make sure all these angles match up correctly. We have our sight angle, which is 90 degrees to the table, and our angle angle, which is the one that is the, the angle of the arm spindle. And we drill a 3 eighths hole down, and then we come up with a taper. Trevor's telling me I'm off my sight lines there. That's why he's correcting me. And then this tapering drill bit comes up, and then we make sure that our spindle comes up through it at least one quarter of an inch, and then we know we're in the right spot. There you can see. Sometimes we use the laser method, sometimes we use the mirror method. You got to try the mirror method. If you just have your bevel on the table and you're watching the mirror and the drill at the same time, it's pretty amazing how it works. Now we're doing a dry fit, coming down, making sure that the bent back lives where it's supposed to. We have a center line on the bow back, which is just off camera. It's right at the crest of the bow back. And we make sure with a laser that it lands in line with the line down the center of the seat. And you can see that's what we're doing there. We're checking to make sure that everything is where it needs to live, or choochy, as I sometimes say, making sure everything's choochy. And now it's time to begin to drill the holes that go through the continuous bent back. There is a jig, which I don't think I show in this video, but they say you can go cowboy style or you can use the jig. I decided to go cowboy style just to get some learning in. In this case, you sight down the drill bit to the hole and then you move it completely into your eyesight so you're imagining you're looking through the drill at the hole you just lined up at. You see I put my pencil there so I knew which hole to point at. And this is what they call cowboy style, jokingly. And you're just pointing the drill bit at the hole that you need to be with. And then you could step back and look through the hole and make sure that you look like you're pretty good through there. And Two holes, the three, the third spindle back from the from the the turn spindle on each side is a blind spindle. And that's so that when you push down on it, it has something to positively stop against. So it is a blind spindle. You have to use the mirror technique. You have to be straight and angled. So you see I'm using both of those. One is a 90 and one is set back at the right bevel and that's blind. It doesn't go all the way through, but it is a flat bottom hole. And then I do a dry fit and I don't show it, but we take an inside measurement. So we know that the third spindle from each side is an exact measurement. And now here we're just doing everything's out of the kiln. Each one of these sticks gets their, their final sizing with the draw knives and really with the spoke shaves, making sure everything snugly fits in the half inch hole at the bottom. That's what Greg was talking about. You don't want to go too far, and then you end up with gappage. Wood filler is, probably doesn't exist inside this shop. I think people have to go home with the shameful gaps. If you put gaps 
you have to wear them like the scarlet letter in this type of class. Now we're getting our spindles that hold the, the continuous bent back in place. Lots of dry fitting. Now once these are permanently attached, we'll dry fit the bow back a few times with all the spindles in place. Now all the spindles get glued in place at the right angle. That's why it's important to sight them down through with the drill. Make sure that each one of these angles are the same incidence through the bow back. If they're not, this thing is really difficult to put together. And remember before I check with the pencil depth to make sure each one of those holes is one inch deep. Make sure we have enough glue surface on there. And now the other reason we left these long, it makes it easier to put together. These are going to go, these are going to pop through the bent bow back, come all the way through. And I don't show it because it's a little boring, but I put that on and off about four times. I kept having to thin out some of the spindles so that the bow back would go all the way down. As a matter of speediness, I didn't show all that, but I put it on and off about four times. And we hand cut what's going to take the wedge at the top of the spindle on the, the first spindle on each side. Putting the glue, we put a pencil line and so that we know now we bring that down. And you can see those two blind spindles, they, they land up inside of the bent back. And once they bottom out, we pretty much bottomed out everywhere. And let it, the glue cure for a few minutes and then cut those spindles up at about three eighths of an inch. I'm putting the wedges in each one of the, the turn spindles. You'll notice that the rockers, we fit them and then we take them off because cause you could imagine working on this with the rockers in place, it would be really difficult. And now the skinny spindles get split with a chisel. We've prepared our wedges off camera and the chisel just gets whacked into those, into the end grain and we split them down inside a little bit and then we put a little glue on the wedge and bang the wedge in and you could see this traditional technique and you can imagine how strong that is these chairs hold big fat people like me really well now let that cure and I, I didn't show me just cutting them close with a little pull saw but now with a paring chisel just getting everything nice and beautifully smooth and now we're putting in the rockers the rockers get glued into place tap down and glued into place and then we drill a little hole and bang in an eighth by eighth inch square peg essentially a wooden nail and there I am I'm using the anvil on one side which is a fat hammer and the pegs only go in one side of the the dado and into the rail so it goes about three quarters of the way through it doesn't poke out the opposite side now this is what I was talking about before this is a big sanding block and we get about an eighth of an inch of that sharp edge off and then the chair rocks on the ground much more smoothly than if it was rocking on that sharp edge and plus that sharp edge will mush and chip so this is makes it really nice to rock and there we are we're done accomplished mission accomplished five days later we've each one of us have made a beautiful chair that one is mine and I'm very very proud of this and I don't know if I could do another one alone without Greg's instruction because there was so many details maybe I can now that I have one as reference and there's my fat ass sitting in the chair no creaks no nothing I'm gonna paint it and when I do I'll post the finished painted one on Instagram I highly recommend Greg's class. It's always filled, but he says he has some dropouts from time to time. Big thank you to Greg, Anne of All Trades, and Travis for helping out. It's, it was such a wonderful experience, and now I'm that much smarter, and I can say I built a continuous bow back chair, rocking chair, and like I say in the past, it's just so beautiful, and it's such an honor to be able to say, look at that, I made that. Thank you, Greg.